Good to see you, buddy. Sorry I was late this morning. <laughs> you were late. It was 1029. Huh? It was 1029. Yeah, but we got here almost on time. <laughs> We normally get here about 10 o'clock, so it was good. It was good. I was running late and just just couldn't get finished uh, everything I had to do. So, this is uh, part 39. This is called Thinking Right About Doing Wrong. Thinking Right About Doing Wrong. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you thought that you needed something and you come to find out that what you thought you needed was not what you really needed. I think all of us have probably had that happen in our life multiple times. Just recently, my lawnmower would not crank. Now, uh, I really like my lawnmower. It's one of those ZTRs, those zero turn radius lawnmowers, you know, that you can, you can really cut twice as fast, maybe three times as fast as with a regular lawnmower. But when I went out to the barn to get it, I turned the ignition switch and I got a dreaded hum. And that's about what it was like. It was just a hum. And I, I, I said, well, I, I'll charge the battery. So I went out and I charged the battery and it said it was 100%, and so I went back and I cranked it up again, and it goes, hum, hum. And so I said, well, maybe it's the solenoid switch. You know, being the uh, handy-dandy mechanic that I am, I said, well, I'll go buy a solenoid switch. So I take off up here to laid back and bought a solenoid switch, 20 bucks, right? I get home, I install it, put the solenoid switch in, turn on the ignition switch. Anybody have any idea what sound I heard? It was a what? A uh hum. And so I, I spent, but, and then I thought, well, maybe my battery charger, my battery just doesn't have enough cranking amps, and I'll go get a battery, a new lawn and garden battery. So off I run, it's a $50 battery, but by the time you get paying the fees, it's 74 bucks. I go home, I install the battery, and uh, I, turn on, I, turn, I turn the ignition switch, and any more guesses on what actually happened? I got a what? Uh, um, so, so now I'm up to $94. And uh, as I'm sitting there on the lawnmower, I'm thinking to myself, well, it has to be, it has to be the starter. But I've heard in the past that the starters sometimes just get stuck. They get a little bit older and they get stuck. And that if you hit it with a wrench or a hammer or something, it'll get unstuck. So lo and behold, I took my, I took a, a wrench and I went, I, I lifted up the seat there and I reached back and I, Tapped it two or three times and I turned it on and it went, nun, nun, nun. $94 later. <laughs> 94 What I thought I needed. Well, what? Well, that's, yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm going to take the new battery out, put the old battery back in, make sure that, that that was it. And so, but I spent $94 before I realized that what I thought I needed was not what I needed. And I think that a lot of life is actually like that. Strive so hard to get what we think we wanted or needed, only to find out when we get it that it's not what we needed at all. In fact, I want to say this, this is one of, one of the greatest lessons that you will ever learn in your life, is that one of the worst things that can happen to you, one of the absolute this is, a, this is a principle I've taught here many times, but one of the worst things that can happen to you is when you resist God in different areas of your life and He simply lets you have what you want. He gives you what you want. He doesn't resist it. He doesn't necessarily even discipline you initially. He gives you whatever it is 
that you want. You think you need it, but you didn't really need it. Now this happens, I think, when we repeatedly override God's word and God's clear direction for our life with our own silly little ideas. I, I made a list here. It's like God says. I have a, a list of six things. I'll just go through them quickly. He says, okay, do you want to talk a certain certain way to people? Then go ahead. I'll not stop you. You, you want to talk how you want to talk? You want to use words that are probably inappropriate? Go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. You want to always have your way about everything that comes up in your life? Then go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. Do you want to continue to be an overreactionary person, just react to everything, rather than being able to take your a moment or two and just respond in the way God would want you to respond? Go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. Do you want to remain an angry person every time you don't get your way or somebody says something that you don't like and you just react to it? Well, I'm, I'm not going to stop you. You just you go ahead. I'm, I'm, not going, I'm not going to stop you. You want to ignore my clear instructions in my word? Go ahead. Just go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. You want to do your own thing? You just feel like you got to do your own thing in your life? Then go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. It's not a good picture. And yet this is the way that many people live. They, they have in their mind what it is that they want to do and nothing is going to actually change their mind. All they have to do, if you'll turn there, you don't, I'm not going to read it, but just turn there. You can look at it. I'll show you where. In Romans chapter 1, we've read these verses many times, but... But this is, a, this is a very powerful section of Scripture where it says three times that God gave people up to do what they wanted to do. Three times he says this. He says it in verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. He says in verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions, the natural use for what is against nature. And then in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. So three times, God says to, says to mankind, He says, you don't, you don't want to do what I want you to do? Go ahead. I'm, I'm just going to give you over to it. I'm going to let you do what it is that you want to do. And you can let me know how that turns out for you in the end. So in our, our vernacular, he was simply saying that if you want to live in sin, I'm not going to stop you. One of the worst things that you can do is to ignore, is to disregard uh, to overlook, to discount, or to just actually casually snub what you know God says is not right in your life. You know that something comes up in your life, something that you know that you shouldn't do, and you just casually ignore it, you just overlook it, you're just not willing to deal with it in your life. It's one of the worst things that you can do. Why? The reason it is a really difficult thing is because it becomes a mindset. I'll say that again. It becomes a mindset. It becomes the way that you th begin to think. And a mindset that is it's easily developed if, if you're not careful. And then it becomes a neural pathway. It becomes a neural pathway in your brain. Physically, in your brain, it is growing. Something is growing in your mind that is, is exactly what it is that you are thinking. And in that process, it ultimately, uh, it becomes a lifestyle. And in that process, it ultimately destroys parts 
of your life. Now we're going to talk about this in some detail here this morning, but I want to give you, to begin with, I want to give you key principle number 135. This is really, for me, is a very insightful uh, uh, principle. I think it really has something to say that every one of us need to understand and appreciate and to think about. What your mind is thinking, what your mind is thinking, I'll give you time to write that, what your mind is thinking is what your brain is building. It's what your brain is building. What your mind is thinking is what your brain is actually building. So when you resist God, it destroys your fellowship with Him, and at the same time, it destroys your relationship with other people. As a Christian, as a Christian, you can remain stubborn. You, you can just remain stubborn and resistant to what you know to be His will, and in that process, reach a point where God says to you, this is not where you want to be, but you can reach a point where God says to you, that's how you want to live, and if you just have to do your own thing with no regard for me or my word, then go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. There's a point where he will. But just initially, hey, if you want to, if that's what you want to do, just go ahead, you know. In reality, what God says in Romans 1 is a very strong form of judgment on people who decided that they knew more than God did about life. That they knew more about the, themselves than the creator of them knows about them. But for a Christian, it would be considered, an, uh, and, and so it becomes uh, uh, a, a form of judgment on them, but for a Christian, it would be considered an incredibly strong form of discipline. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, you might want to turn there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Verse 11 says that, teaches that when God disciplines you, that it can be very painful that when God disciplines you, it can be very, very painful. Hebrews 12, 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. It's not joyous. It's not something that you're going to enjoy at all. It's uh, something that is very painful. Nevertheless, afterward... It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The word painful, I looked up the word painful. I didn't do a really in-depth study on it, but the word painful means to bring grief. It means to, to bring stress or, or to be distressed about something, to become very sorrowful in your life. Uh, this, it's, a, it's a pain that creates sorrow and stress and, and grief. In a person's life, I don't know about you, but I have no desire to actually be continuing to resist God literally in any area of my life. If God reveals to me that there is something in my life that's wrong, uh, he certainly does that quite often, unfortunately. It's something that I've said or the way that I've acted or the way that I've responded uh, uh, I, I, I want to yield to that almost immediately if I can, to, to let God change that in my life. I have no interest in continuing to resist God in my life, and I hope that you don't. His will is always better than your will, and it's always better than my will. That's a really fundamental principle that you ought to just anchor down deep somewhere in your heart and in your mind that... <clears throat> God's will is much better for me than my will. Whatever I think my will is, whatever I want to do, is probably going to land me at a place where I don't want to be later on. 
there's some simple decisions that you can make, obviously, that you'll be, you'll be fine. You know, what color dress to wear this morning or what color shirt to put on. James got on a, a red and black one. There's no big deal if he put on a blue one this morning. But those are not the kind of decisions that I'm actually talking about. So it, this has to be your mindset, your way of thinking, what you're developing in your brain. The worst thing that can happen to you Everybody listen very carefully. The worst thing that can happen to one of the worst things, I'll soften it a little bit, one of the worst things that can take place in your life is for God not to intervene in your life when you're doing something that is wrong. Now, I, I want to say that if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, normally what's going to happen if you are doing something that's wrong, that somewhere in that process is that God is going to send somebody into your life. That's what he's going to do. It could be anybody. It could be a friend. It could be your marriage partner. It could, uh, it could be your, uh, your pastor. It could be... It, it could be somebody at work. It could be anybody that knows what you're going through to sort of help you to navigate through something that you're doing in your life that you know is actually wrong. But that's a very bad place to be, to be brought on by some, it's brought on by some very bad thinking when you, God does not intervene in your life when what you're doing you know is actually wrong. Now, this is when you can know that you clearly are not thinking like God thinks. I'm doing something wrong. I know that it's wrong, but I'm not really willing to change. I'm not really willing to make an adjustment. I just, I'm just going to keep doing what I want to do. It's what I want to do, so I'm going to keep doing what it is that I want to do. In fact, and I think this is very important to understand, if you're willing to knowingly and continually as a lifestyle, as a lifestyle, as a way of life to resist God in your life, to rebel against what you know that he has stated in his word, the chances that you may not be saved are greatly elevated in my mind. I think scripture is very clear on this. Let me give you a couple of verses. Uh, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and Verse 8. Look, look at verse 8. You're, you're there in, that, in verse 11, but just look at verse 8. It says, but if you are without chastening. Now, the only reason that God chastens his children is when they do something that is outside of his will. When something in their life is displeasing to him. When, when it's wrong. When it's not what he actually desires for them. But if you're without chastening, of which all have become partakers, in other words, every single one of us have been disciplined by God at different times, then you are Ill illegitimate and not sons. A lot of times if I see somebody, I look at their life, and I recognize that they're, they're, they're living in sin in, 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 in any, any kind of capacity, not just, not that they stubbed their toe and said something they shouldn't have said. That's not what we're talking about here. But they're living habitually in a manner that's displeasing to God. The chances of them not being saved have been greatly elevated. It says here, you are illegitimate and not sons. Go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I want to read verse 6 through 9, and I'm going to add some words. I'll tell you the words that I'm going to add to it as I go through here. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, sort of put the words in parentheses for you. It says in verse 6, Whoever uh, abides in him does not sin habitually. I'm adding these continually as, as a habit of life. Whoever sins, I'm going to add these words again, habitually, 
continually as a habit of life. It's his lifestyle. That's what the present tense of this verb for sins means. In both cases, it's an ongoing process. That's what it means. It's an ongoing process of continually, habitually doing something to the point that it becomes a lifestyle. Whoever sins habitually, I'm, I'm adding the, this part, habitually and continually as a habit of their life has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Don't, don't let anybody deceive you. He who practices righteous, righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins habitually, continually, as a habit of life, I've added that, he who sins habitually, continually, as a habit of life, is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the, this purpose, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy, destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God, anybody that's a believer, does not sin, parentheses, habitually, continually, as a habit of life. We're all going to sin. But we're talking about something that you do that becomes a habit in your life, something that you're not willing to give up. So whoever has been born of God does not sin habitually, continually as a habit of life, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, parentheses, habitually, continually, as a habit of life, because he has been born of God. Now, I want to say that willful sin against God, any time that you're doing something in your life, it's willful, and you know that it's against God's clear will for your life, it's a difficult place to find yourself. And it will, you will not be pleased with the results that it's going to create in your life. No matter what it is. Be big, be small, whatever it is. But whenever you know that you're doing something that is grieving the Spirit of God in your life, uh, it, can be, it can be a very difficult place with the worst of results. Now, I'm reminded of the story in Genesis 27. I want you to turn there. I'm not going to read Genesis 27, but I want you just, you can kind of glance down as I'm talking and just sort of, read through some of this with me. This is the story of when this is the story when Rebecca wanted her son Jacob to receive the blessing from Isaac. The blessing for the firstborn. Now, Jacob was not the firstborn. Jacob was the secondborn. You remember he they were twins, and he grabbed the heel of, of, uh, of uh, Esau as he was coming out of the womb. And his name, Jacob, actually means supplanter. It means deceiver. And so she wanted him to receive Isaac's blessing. There were two things involved. There was the birthright, which I, I'm assuming that um, Esau had already been granted. And then there was the blessing. And some people felt that the blessing was even greater than the birthright that they would give. And so Jacob uh, actually questioned what she was doing. Look in verse 12. It says, perhaps my father will feel me because Esau was very hairy and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. So Jacob knew that what his mother was asking him, asking him to do was wrong. Rebecca knew that what she was uh, asking Jacob to do was wrong because uh, Isaac had sent Esau out to uh, uh, get some, uh, something from the uh, field to go out and, and to bring in some uh, and make him some stew that he loved. 
so that he could offer the blessing, and Rebecca had heard that. So she knew that what she was scheming was wrong, but she followed through with it. In fact, she said in verse 13, look at it, but his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son, only obey my voice and go get them for me. She was going to make the soup and, and, and everything rather than Esau. Now, I want you to notice the words that she says. This is very important. She says, let, let your curse be on me. That probably wasn't a very good thing for her to say. Little did she know that that was exactly what would happen. Unfortunately, unfortunately, her scheme actually worked. It actually worked. That was probably the worst thing that could have happened to her is that the scheme actually worked, and it did. It was like God said, you know this is wrong, but I'm not going to stop you. And you'll have to suffer the consequences. You'll have to accept the curse, whatever that was. And you know the story. She cooked the meal that Jacob had asked Esau to prepare, and she got, she successfully, she got him some rough stuff for his, uh, for his arm, so it felt like Esau's, and she got him to deceive and lie to his father and received the blessing for the firstborn. In fact, Isaac asked him, he says, this, your voice sounds like, it doesn't sound like Esau's. He says, no, I'm Esau's. So they've lied to their father. He's stolen the blessing that God, that uh, Isaac wanted to give to Esau. And remember that Jacob was the second born and he was, he was willing to steal what he knew was not his. So when Esau found out, when Esau found out what had happened, he was enraged. And so his mother, Rebecca, told Isaac, I mean, uh, Jacob, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go. I want you to flee to my brother's house. I want you to go to Laban's house, and you'll be okay there until, until Esau just kind of settles down, right? Until he actually <laughs> settles down. Because uh, Esau said, uh, was scheming, he said, I'm going to kill him right after Isaac dies, right after my dad dies. So she fled, uh, he fled to her brother Laban's house, it was Laban, for a very short while until Esau's anger calmed down. That's what she wanted him to do. Now listen very carefully. Listen very, very carefully. Little did Rebecca, Rebecca know that she would never ever again see her beloved son Jacob. She would never see him again. She got what she wanted but it wasn't what she needed. Right? She lied. She deceived. She schemed. She got what she wanted but it wasn't what she needed. And so what she thought that she wanted and so diligently schemed to get was not even close to what she got. She was not thinking right about doing wrong. I'll say it again. She was not thinking right about doing wrong. And her plan for what she thought would be the very best turned out to actually be the very worst. Her best became the worst because she knew that she was disobeying God and doing what he did not want her to do. I call this, this is my own term, I call this nightmare thinking. Nightmare thinking. Thinking that what is wrong will some, somehow turn out right. 
thinking that I can do something that is wrong, something that I know is wrong, and that in the end that it's going to turn out okay, that it's going to turn out good, it's going to turn out right. It never will. She was building her life not on God's truth, but she was building her life on not what was best for her life or her family, but on what she wanted, and in the end what she received was far worse than what she ever thought that she would get. Apparently she never understood what it means to think like God thinks. Just never, never figured it out. So let me ask the obvious question from a spiritual perspective. Let us see if we can figure out the right answer. Let's just see if we can work through this and come up with the right answer. Let's say that you're not sure how to handle a very difficult circumstance in your life. It could be any, any, anything. I, I don't even want to surmise what it may be. But let's just say that you are struggling to figure out how to handle a difficult circumstance in your life. The question is, well, what do you do? What do you do? Where do you go for your answers? How do you make a decision when you are staring down something that is a very difficult decision in your life? Do you just rely on your instincts or do you just rely on your gut feeling? Maybe you... I uh, read a book, some kind of worldly book, just recently, and it had some suggestions in there. Are you like Rebecca and Jacob, where you're willing to do something, to do something that you know is both wrong and very displeasing to God? You can apply any of those. You can apply any of those and any other kind of reasons or rationalizations as to what to do when what you're doing is wrong before God and you know it. And eventually, ultimately, finally, I doubt that your odds for long-term success will be very good. And let me say it in terms of this study. This is our 39th study, right? Let me say it in terms of this study. This, is a mind, this becomes a mindset. This becomes a person's mindset. This becomes their way of thinking. It becomes their way of thinking. And so, on how you're going to deal with difficult moments in your life. So, if you know that you are doing something that is wrong, the title of this today is Right Thinking About Doing Wrong. So, thinking right about doing wrong. So, if you know that's happening, you must change how you think. If any of the kind of areas that we have addressed are a propensity and an inclination in your life, you can keep thinking however you want to. You can keep thinking however you choose. Right? Just, just hear my heart. You can think whatever you want to. You can think however you want to think. But in the end, you will never be pleased with the results. So I want to give you key principle number 136. Key principle number 136. You cannot ignore God and His Word You cannot ignore God and His Word and have His blessing and have His blessing on your life. You cannot ignore God and His Word and have His blessing on your life. 
So I want to give you a biblical answer. I want you to turn to John chapter 6 and verse 63. John chapter 6, verse 63. I doubt for many Christians that this verse will even come close to satisfying them. But in the long run, it's the only hope that you have for success. And most Christians never even see that reality. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. Verse 63. He said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Now, I'm going to let you wrestle with the phrase, the flesh profits nothing, but I will say that the ISV and the New American, the New Revised Standard Version translated as, and I love this, the flesh is useless. All my ideas, just everything that I think ultimately, when it gets down to the bottom line, are not really going to have any great benefit for my life. I love that translation, the flesh is useless. My silly little ideas and notions about life are useless in a spiritual war that has an invisible enemy who's very skilled in deception. I can't even see him. I can see the results of what he does, but I cannot even see him. He, he could care less about my ideas. He could care less about what I think. There may be some times when worldly thinking may suffice for a little bit, but nothing can compare to the words that Jesus spoke. I made a list of the things that I don't believe can even compare to what Jesus' words say to us. No words, no ideas, no philosophies, no opinions, no schemes, no brainstorms, no theories, no whims, no nothing. None of that can compare. None of those can compare to what Jesus says to his words. The words that I speak to you they are spiritual words. They are life-giving words. They are life-transforming transforming words. They are words that change a person's life. They'll change your life. They will change my life. If I will just listen to them, if I will just obey them, if I will just allow them a place in my heart and in my mind, they will change my life. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. You can try to work everything out on your own if you so choose. You can do that. You can devise your different approaches to what people may call conflict resolution. We hear that term used a lot, conflict resolution. I use it, you know. I want to figure out how to resolve this, but I doubt that in the long run that any of these things, these ideas and philosophies and opinions and schemes and brainstorms and theories and whims and whatever else will really work that well for you. We have a little sign hanging up over our doorway. It's Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, and it says, Lean not unto your own understanding. All right, and uh, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. It says, trust in the Lord. I, I want to read that to you out of the Amplified Bible. I like the way that it says it. It says, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind. And do not rely on your own insight or understanding. Don't rely on your own thinking. In John 6, verse 63, Jesus is saying that his words 
that they are supernatural words and that they give you the life and the wisdom, the understanding, the strength, the hope, and the help that you need in very difficult moments of your life. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to listen very carefully to my next statement. It's not a key principle, but I want you to, to listen very carefully. If you really want to grow in your spiritual walk as a Christian, this is so super important. To me, this is one of those mega, mega truths, mega principles that every Christian needs to understand. You must bring God into every difficult moment of your life. You must bring God into every difficult moment of your life. And you do that by allowing His Word to govern your every thought, your every response and your every decision in those difficult moments. That's how you bring God into every difficult moment of your life. You let His Word, you let the Word of God, what the Word of God says, govern, control, dictate what it is that you think, what it is that you say, and what it is that you do. Very important principle, super important, mega principle for your life and for my life. If what and how you're thinking is something that you know is contrary to God's word, then you have to change your thinking to align itself with how you know God wants you to think and what God wants you to do. What you think, if I listen very carefully, if I listen, I can just run through this quickly and and it just not it just just go right on past you. What you think is what you will do. The man thinks in his heart, so is he. What you think is what you're going to do. How you think is how you're going to to live. These are very simple principles that we've I've mentioned multiple times throughout these nearly 40 weeks. So you have to discipline your mind to think right about your willingness to do what you know is wrong. It's very rare that you ever immediately experience the end result of choosing to do the wrong thing. Everybody hear what I just said? It's rare, it's rare that you ever immediately receive the results of, of choosing to do something that you know is actually wrong. I made a list of things. You can lie, you can cheat, you can ignore God, you can choose. We talked about it what, a, a couple of weeks ago. You can. Choose the path of least resistance in your life. You can curse. You can be angry with people all the time. You can develop bad habits in your life if you so choose, but generally it takes a while for all of those kind of choices to work themselves out into your life. In, in, in the way that is more permanent. Just think about the person that lies, cheats on their, cheats on their income tax. I'll just say that. It doesn't, there's no, there, you know, they turn it in, they send them a check, there's no, there's no real, anything happens and then a little bit later they get audited, they get, they get checked for some reason. They may make it a couple times. They may make it three, four times. Who knows? I don't know how the, all of that works, but I don't think it's good. 
it takes a while, everybody, look, it takes a while when you fire that arrow for it, you, we know immediately what its trajectory is, but it takes a little while for it to land. And so you want to be very careful. And then it may be way too late to repair. Here's what's happened. Here's what's happened. We're talking about somebody that's willing, not willing to change what they know is wrong in their life. You have developed a mindset that has physically built a neural pathway in your brain that has now become a stronghold in your life. I'm going to say that again. You've built a neural pathway in your brain that has become a stronghold in your life. And the stronghold, everybody listen, the stronghold becomes stronger than you are. I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss what I'm saying. The stronghold becomes stronger than you are. It's something that you can't quit. It's something that you can't stop doing. It's something that you don't want to stop. It's like the drug addict or the alcoholic or the smoker or whatever it may be. I'm just using those as obvious examples, you know, or the person that's angry all the time. So you, you develop a mindset. Your mind knows what, your brain knows what your mind is thinking. It develops a neural pathway. The neural pathway develops, becomes bigger and bigger. It becomes a stronghold in your life. And next thing you know, the stronghold is stronger than you are. So if you do not develop this habit of bringing God into your life, then what's going to happen is that the enemy is going to build multiple strongholds in, into your life. It's not like, well, he's just got one or two. He begins to build multiple strongholds in a person's life. And they will be very difficult to remove once they are established, especially the more that you accumulate. It was really interesting to me. I, th I mean, I already knew this, but it was very interesting to me. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. We've talked about this a number of times. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Plural. This is the only place in the New Testament that this word for strongholds is actually utilized. It's utilized many times in the Old Testament, but mainly as a fortress. In fact, it could actually be, you could actually, some of the translations, you could actually translate it, uh, it they're mighty in God for pulling down fortresses, mental fortresses in your mind. In this context, strongholds is specifically referring the bad things, wrong things, ungodly things, wrong thinking, bad attitudes, bad morals, caustic speech, anything that is contrary to what you know God desires for your life. Now, I want you to think of a, here's, here's how I want you to think of a stronghold, all right? Here's how I want you to think of a stronghold. Think of a stronghold as any idea. It, it, it probably do you good to write these. I only got three or four. A stronghold is any idea, any philosophy, any person, and I want to say any ungodly person, and any wrong thinking 
that has a strong hold on your life. It could be anybody. It could be a somebody that has a strong hold on your life and on your mind, on your way of thinking. I want to give you just a short list. I think I have 10. It doesn't seem short, does it? I want to give you a, a short list of what creates strongholds in people's lives. Now, what I want you to understand before I give you the list, all right, before I give you the list here, I want you to understand strongholds as being the lies from the devil that people believe and act on. There's a difference between the enemy trying to deceive you with a lie. There's another thing that you accept that lie and that you act on that lie, right? So it does not matter from where they come, from whom they may come, but every lie originates with and is prolonged because of the enemy. Here's some examples would be as follows. It's okay for me to get angry. It's not. It's okay for me to yell at my children. It's not. If they were running out in the road and the car was coming, I'd yell as loud as I could, but that's not what we're talking about. It's okay for me to curse. It's not. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good for edification, that it may minister grace to the ears. It's okay for me to watch immoral movies on TV. It's not. It's okay for me to talk ugly to people. It's not. It's okay for me to be impatient with everybody. It's not. It's okay for me to not read my Bible. It's not. It's okay for me to do my own thing when I want to do my own thing. It's not. It's okay for me to ignore my relationship with God because I have other priorities. It's not. It's okay for me to hold a grudge and be bitter if I so choose. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. The list is endless. I, I could write page after page after page of these kind of things, non-biblical, useless strongholds that people have to, allowed to be developed in their life, lives. Here's the problem, so listen carefully. Here's the problem. Every one of these kind of lies, these are just some simple things here. You could have, you could have written these up. You could, have, you could have figured this out on your own. Every one of these kinds of lies that you accept in your mind and act on, okay, you accept them and then you act on them, they become neural pathways. And the more that you act on them, the stronger, the larger, the bigger, the neural pathway physically becomes in that particular area of your life. It just grows. And grows. We talked about this many times. It just grows and grows and grows. And it just keeps on growing. When you accept these, and eventually they will become a stronghold in your life. Anyone who is willing to forsake God and His Word can easily have all ten of these strongholds in their life. Any, anybody, anybody that's just not willing to do what God wants them to do can have all of these, and they can have many more. I don't want you to think today that you can only have just one or two strongholds. I'm convinced, personally, you could have a hundred. If you, if you ignore God's word, almost everything in your life can become a stronghold. Listen, you can have an endless number of strongholds 
where you have allowed the enemy to penetrate your mind with his lies and you have believed them and you have acted on them. The less attention that you give to the strongholds that you know exist in your life. You may not even realize it. You may have so many that you don't, you just don't even realize it. But the less attention that you give to any personal strongholds that you may have, the more strongholds the enemy is going to develop in your life. If you don't pay attention to the ones that you have, then the enemy is going to just simply keep developing more in your life. And rather than the number of strongholds that you get being diminished, they're going to begin to actually grow. Before you know it, your life is out of control. I'm going to give you key principle number 137. Key principle number 137. Every stronghold, every stronghold that you allow the enemy, every stronghold that you allow the enemy to create in your life, every stronghold that you allow the enemy to create in your life, the greater control, the greater control you give him over your life. The greater control you give him over your life. I'll read that sentence. Every stronghold you allow the enemy to create in your life, the greater control you give him over your life. This is inevitable. This is I would say that this is unavoidable if you allow that in your life and you do not think like God thinks. No wonder people are struggling so much in their life. The devil has deceived them. He has built a fortress. That's the right word. He's built a stronghold. He has built a fortress in their mind and in their brain. In two places. It's a fortress in their mind and a fortress in their brain. And then he proceeds to build another one. He's, he's never going to be satisfied with just one or two. So the longer that you allow this to keep happening in your life, the more difficult it becomes to defeat the enemy and his lies the more difficult it becomes to resist the lies, the more easily it is for him to deceive you because you're not resisting the lies that he's already given to you. And as well, it, 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 if you cannot defeat the enemy's lies, you will have great, a great deal of struggle defeating sin that may be in your life. When you start to make progress, here's what's happened. Let's say you say, hey, I want to make a turnaround. I, I know things aren't going right in my life. I want to make a turnaround. You start, to, you start to make a little bit of progress. The first thing that the enemy does is that he runs to one of your stronger strongholds. He goes to the neural pathway that's stronger. He just runs there. And he's able to defeat you. So I want to re-emphasize this. I've already shared it once this morning, but I want to re-emphasize it again. I do not want you to forget that a stronghold is not just something that is unspiritual in your mind. It's not just something unspiritual in your mind. It is something that is actually growing in your brain. It's actually growing in your brain in a neural pathway. 
So let me give you just an obvious example. I, I, could, I could come up with a hundred of these. I'm just going to take one that's... Let's just say that assume that somebody has become addicted to becoming angry when things do not go their way. They know that being angry is wrong. They know that being angry is not what God wants. But hey, I, you know, I just felt like talk, uh, I felt like speaking my mind. I, I just want to do what I want to do. I felt like I had to say that. And what they've done is create a strong neural pathway in their brain for becoming angry. And so at some point they decide, hey, you know, I don't like the results of this, so I want, I want to change my life. I want my life to change. I'm not satisfied. I know that this is not right. But the problem is that when a conflict arises that displeases them, the enemy will keep taking them back to the stronghold. He'll take them back to their anger stronghold. Somebody will say something that they don't like. Somebody will, you know, uh, just say it in a way that they, you know, I didn't like you saying it that way. And the next thing you know, almost immediately they become angry. It's a stronghold. It's a stronghold. And the enemy always runs back to the stronghold. He has a temptation that he can use against you at almost any time that he pleases and that person will yield and be defeated in their desire to change and just give up just give up when they know that what's wrong in their life is wrong now when you choose to think however it is that you may want to think and you leave God out of your thinking, what you're actually doing is building uh, a stronghold in your mind and building a stronghold uh, in a newer pathway that can ultimately destroy your life and your soul. Now here's what I think. Here's what I want you to think. I mean, here's what I want you to appreciate. Many people think that a stronghold what we're talking about today as something like getting drunk all the time or taking drugs or uh, watching pornography or, or stealing or stealing money from somebody all the time. And that would be right. That would be right. If, if, if you do all of those things, it's a stronghold in your life. However, as obvious and as, as correct as that may be, not everyone's drinking not everyone's watching pornography and not everyone's stealing money from somebody else and not everybody's taking drugs. I'm not doing any of those. But they can still be deceived by the enemy and their life can be filled with multiple strongholds that are destroying their relationships with people. It's destroying their fellowship with God. It's damaging their families and ultimately destroying their life. So for the lost person, let's just say somebody's lost, for the lost person, the more of these strongholds that the enemy can generate and create in a person's life, the more they allow Satan to develop them in their life, the greater are the chances. Listen carefully, this is important to me. The greater are the chances that they will never ever enter into God's kingdom for the lost person. Right? They've got so many strongholds. And even if they wanted to do the right thing, even if they wanted to respond, they've got strongholds that just hinder them from being able to do that. For the saved person that has these strongholds, the greater it will be their struggle with sin. And it's doubtful that they will have any kind of meaningful relationship with God or other people. I want to give you a key principle, number 138. Key principle number 138. The more you accept Satan's lies... The more that you accept 
Satan's lies. The more his lies, the more his lies will dictate more his lies will dictate and control your entire life and behavior. I'm convinced that it will it will ultimately control your eternity. The good news is that the opposite is true. Once you accept God's truth, God's truth will dictate and control your entire life, behavior, and eternal destiny. Here's what you want to happen, so listen very carefully. I'll talk about this some next week. This is very important to me. You want to see your Christian life as one of always adjusting and changing your thought life to align with how God thinks. That's the way I want to think. I want to always see my life as something that I'm, where I'm always adjusting. I'm always aligning my life and my thinking to align with how God thinks. I want you to think of the Christian life as adjusting, realigning, as correcting, as fine-tuning, as modifying your life to be aligned with God's truth and God's will. So, let's just assume that whatever may be happening in your life personally, that there is a question that you can ask yourself. Here's the, here's the way that you allow that to begin to happen in your life. Right? I'm going to teach, repeat, 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 right? This is how you can, you can figure out whether or not you're going to actually do that. Something comes up in your life, you want to ask a very simple question. Am I responding how God would want me to respond? Am I responding how God would want me to respond? Listen, the answer is either yes or no. The answer is either yes or no. So please do not make it difficult. The moment that you start to rationalize, the moment you start to justify, and for making excuses, for making the wrong choices, right? The moment that you do that, internally, spiritually, you know that it's, the answer is no. No, this is not aligning with what God wants me to do. This is not me adjusting. And at that point, you're literally rejecting the perfect will of God for your life. I doubt that will work out very well. So if this adjusting is not happening in your life and in your mind and if your life is rarely, if ever, making godly changes and adjustments, there's something that is strategically missing in your life. There's something strategically that is absent and missing in your life. My humble opinion, that's all that it is, is that if you're never ever making changes, you're never making godly adjustments that you may not even be saved. That's just my opinion. For somebody that you know, even for yourself. I honestly believe that Satan's greatest victory is when he convinces somebody that they are saved, when in reality they're not saved. 
at all. I'm not trying to tell anybody here today or anybody that's listening to this that you're not saved. That's not my purpose. My purpose is what I'm saying. Look at your life. Just look at your life to make sure that when you know you, got, you want to think right about doing wrong, that when you're doing something that's wrong, are you willing to make the adjustments and the corrections that are necessary to get your life back in alignment with God's will? If you don't, you're going to build strongholds. You're building strongholds against the will of God, against the mind of God. The enemy, he's very slick at this. He says to people that they made a decision at some point in time or that they were baptized or that they believed some particular idea and his primary tool for this is religion. You've heard me say it many times that religion is deadly. It's deadly. It's deadly. He's a very skillful opponent and he has a very subtle way of telling people that they are saved when they're not actually saved. Listen carefully. And I'll close with this statement. God Almighty in heaven is the only source of life that there is. God Almighty in heaven is the only source of life that there is, so you must yield your life to Him. The words that Jesus spoke are the only words that can save. And the scriptures are your only hope for godly success and salvation. The scriptures are your only hope for godly success and salvation. Amen? Anybody have any questions or comments?